Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our sustainability webinar series. I'm Ashley Diaz, the sustainability planner for Bowie, and I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker. Dr. Steve Werenberg is the chair of the city's Environmental Advisory Committee with a background in energy and environmental issues and in managing large scale change efforts. He retired from the Coast Guard in 2015 after a combined military and civilian career of 47 years. If you wanna know more or would like to contact him regarding the Environmental Advisory Committee, I'll put a link to his bio in the follow-up email to this webinar. Uh, just a reminder, please utilize the Q&A box for questions. We'll get to them right after Steve's talk. And again, I will be sending a follow-up email to all of you with some resources and things that are handy. Um, with that said, let's get into episode three, defossilizing your homestead inside and out. Over to you, Steve. All right, assuming everybody can hear me at this point, give me a nod if you would, Ashley. That's a nice nod, great. Um, what we'd like to do uh, today is uh, take a look at uh, what we call defossilizing your home. In other words, how can you have as little uh, fossil fuel inside your home uh, and uh, your you know, surrounding property, whatever it is you might own, uh, both inside and out. Uh, that means that we're gonna talk a little bit about what fossil fuels are and where they come from, uh, a little bit about what their uses are, and uh, a lot about alternatives to the kinds of things that, uh, that we'll be showing you. So on that note, let's just start right off the bat by talking about what fossil fuels really are. There's, there we go. So uh, what are fossil fuels? Well, I've got a short video here. It's uh, less than two minutes long, but it's the best description I could find, so bear with it. Fossil fuels. Fossil fuel is a term used to describe a group of energy sources that were formed from ancient plants and organisms during the Carboniferous period approximately 360 to 286 million years ago, even before the age of dinosaurs. At that time, the land was covered with swamps filled with organisms and plants. As they died, they sank to the bottom of swamps and oceans and over millions of years started decomposing under layers of sand, clay, and other minerals. Different types of fossil fuels formed depending on the combination of organic matter, temperature, time, and pressure conditions while decomposing. There are three major types of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Coal was formed from ferns, plants, and trees, which hardened due to pressure and heat. Oil was formed from small organisms, like zooplankton and algae, where pressure caused the more complex organic matter to decompose. Natural gas was formed by the same process as oil, only it was exposed to more heat and pressure, causing it to further decompose and turn into a gaseous form. Fossil fuels are sought after energy sources because they have a high energy density. They are the world's dominant energy source. Fossil fuels have a variety of applications from electricity production to transport fuels. They can also be used to make a variety of common products from plastics to cosmetics to even some medicines. These resources have powered industrialization over history and continue to do so today. Fossil fuels can be an abundant and cheap, or in some cases, a scarce and expensive form of energy, depending on geographic location. For this reason, geopolitical issues arise due to scarcity caused by the natural geographic allocation of these highly valuable resources. Fossil fuels are considered non-renewable resources because they take millions of years to form, which means that once they are used, the resources will not be replenished in a human lifetime. The gradual depletion of the most accessible fossil fuel reserves have forced companies to develop technologies for extracting more challenging or unconventional reserves. In many cases, this means additional safety and environmental concerns as well as higher costs. Fossil fuels are also the largest emitters of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas which causes climate change. In addition, their production causes both environmental and human health issues. These concerns have triggered society to look at alternate sources of energy that are more environmentally sustainable and renewable. That's fossil fuels. So, quick review. Fossil fuel examples, coal, oil, natural gas, and all of the derivatives of oil, kerosene and propane and, and uh, being among them. So uh, a lot of different ways those things can get into your house. And uh, we will talk about that. 
In addition to the fact that these are used as fuels, uh, this uh, diagram uh, shows at the very bottom oil and gas, which is changed into or converted to uh, all kinds of uh, chemicals, which are further converted, which are further converted, which are further converted. Uh, those final products include all the things you see listed there and a lot more. And their uses are uh, described at the very top ring of that. So you can see that, that there's a, a lot of stuff in that top ring, clothing, uh, vehicles, pharmaceuticals, all kinds of consumer products, building materials, uh, even, uh, even some medicines and uh, a lot of what's involved in healthcare. So uh, fossil fuels are, have been uh, very important to us. Uh, and the fact that there are some downsides leads us to realize that we've got to find alternatives to these uh, uh, fossil fuels for all of these uses. Uh, just to take a quick look at some of the more direct uses, you put gasoline in your car, you put oil in your in your vehicles and in your engines. Uh, over on the far right is a uh, gas-fired uh, hot water heater, and uh, sort of uh, in the upper part of that is a uh, oil-fired uh, heating system. And then on the, the second from the right is a combined uh, natural gas and oil-fired uh, heating and hot water heating system. So all of those are ways that, <clears throat> pardon me, that I'm sure many of you uh, produce heat and produce hot water and produce transportation for that matter. So, it, however, uh, looking at some of the other, and, and you know, we're not going to uh, describe all these, but you can see from this picture that all of the things made from oil are far beyond what you might even think at all. I mean, you know, come on, Legos, right? Okay, good. Uh, umbrellas, sneakers, garden hoses, printer ink. Uh, all these things are derived, at least in part, from, uh, from uh, the petroleum industry. And, uh, you know, here's another uh, montage of some of the things that you might have in your household that are obviously um, uh, used by everyone. And they are uh, at their source uh, generated through the use of petroleum products and fossil fuels. I bet everybody has some of these in their home. Crayons are made out of petroleum. Uh, pill bottles are made out of petroleum. And some of the pills in the bottles are made using petroleum and petroleum derivatives. So you probably have those in your home. And, you know, even outside and in the realm of crazy, there are all kinds of other things that are produced by petroleum industry. Um, and, you know, it turns out that over the, over the decades of, of use of all these petroleums, it's, it's been really a great benefit to us. Uh, however, the costs are starting to pile up, so we're going to have to make some changes. Uh, this list will be provided in the follow-up email, but it just lists uh, some of the things that we've just described, that, uh, and some of which may surprise you. Uh, it, it, interestingly, uh, um, plastic single-use plastic bottles may be used to create eyeglass frames, uh, but then that's it. The eyeglass frames can't be recycled, so there we go. And uh, this uh, describes the fact that there's probably not any space in your home that doesn't have some petroleum um, derivative or uh, other fossil fuel derivative uh, in your house, uh, everywhere you look. So um, having said that, uh, it's also uh, interesting to note that petroleum products, these are obviously a couple of alternatives for electrical uh, generation, uh, solar panels and wind turbines. Uh, but the downside there is that solar panels are made using petroleum products and using uh, uh, you know, petroleum-based uh, energy to create. And uh, wind turbines are made out of usually a combination of fiberglass and plastics, uh, at least for the blades. So, um, you know, there's nothing that, that we can think of that, that doesn't, isn't touched in some way by petroleum products. Now, uh, another term we need to describe real quick is this notion of homestead. We said, you know, your homestead, well, it's a typical buoy homestead. You know, it's your house, it's your grounds, the surrounding uh, area, whatever might be uh, uh, considered to be yours. Uh, if you own your home, it just might be your apartment or if a condo, some common areas as well. Uh, but that's what we mean by homestead. So any, any, and we'll describe that a little bit further in a couple of minutes. 
let's, uh, it, it turns out that I've said a couple of times that there are some benefits to uh, fossil fuel use that have led to a, a pretty good lifestyle for most of us. Uh, let's uh, take a look at some of the benefits and then the costs of using these petroleum-based uh, fossil fuels and how we can avoid some of those costs. So here's another short video. This one's about two minutes long. Fossil fuels are terrible. If I could get in a time machine and go back to the 1700s, I'd do everything I could to make sure the Industrial Revolution never happened, right? This may shock you, but I'm going to say it anyways. I am grateful for the progress fossil fuels have enabled us to make. Without them, I'd be living a life that was far shorter and much more miserable. In fact, without the medical advances that have come with our progress, I'd very likely be dead already. And I don't know about you, but I like electricity and technology and being able to visit interesting parts of the world through the miracles of travel and television and the internet. All things that have now become commonplace thanks to energy from fossil fuels. So if they've brought us all these benefits, does that mean we should keep using them forever? I think it's appropriate to acknowledge and be grateful for the benefits that coal and gas and oil have brought us. But what we know today that we didn't know all that much about 300 years ago is that they also have significant drawbacks. A big price tag attached, in fact, and that price is coming due. And what we also know today is that there are better, cleaner sources of energy to power our growth going forward. When it comes to fossil fuels, it's time to move on. And move on we must. A couple of interesting things that come from, uh, from Catherine's video, and she's an atmospheric scientist of great renown. Um, she mentioned all the benefits that have accrued to us, uh, particularly here in America from fossil fuel use, which creates some interesting geopolitical problems. Uh, third world countries that are trying to catch up with the rest of the world are, of course, interested in the cheap, dominant uh, uh, fossil fuel based source of energy. And for, you know, the, for us and other developed nations and for the UN to say, uh, you know, gosh, we're just going to have to reduce the use of fossil fuels. It's sort of like you're saying to the developed, uh, to the undeveloped world, uh, tough, you know, tough patooties, buddy, uh, we got ours and, and uh, now it's too dangerous for you to get yours. So, um, those kinds of problems have to be solved, and fortunately, they are being solved. And a lot of uh, a lot of nations are just going straight to renewables and and bypassing the whole fossil fuel area, the whole the whole era of of uh, cheap fuel. Uh, this is an image, and this is a current image, by the way, of what it looks like to build a tunnel into a coal mine. Uh, it looks like pretty nasty work, and it is pretty nasty work, and it's quite dangerous. Uh, you can see on the left there that the ceiling is being propped up by a log. Um, eh, that's uh, not something that I would want to do. And, and of course, you know, coal is by far the, the dirtiest of all the fossil fuels. It burns uh, dirty and it creates more pollutants, more particulate matter and more CO2 uh, than any other form of fossil fuel. So the image on the right is uh, kind of shocking. This is a result of what's called mountaintop uh, uh, removal, mountaintop removal for the sake of coal. A uh, company will come in and just sort of peel the top off a mountain and uh, let all the detritus that's peeled off go down the side of the mountain, usually into streams and rivers and things, and then uh, get the coal out. Uh, and of course, it's left there like a, uh, almost like a lunar landscape because even though they they claim they can reclaim all this, they can reclaim all this in probably 100 or 200 years. Uh, but in the meantime, it's going to look a lot like this for quite some time. So pretty ugly. We need not to do that anymore. And of course, uh, uh, on the upper right, you see an oil-fired uh, plant, uh, electrical plant. And uh, one of the interesting things about oil is that when you when you um, when you bring oil up, you often bring up a lot of natural gas with it because they tend to be in the same, roughly the same places. And for decades, uh, rather than trying to capture that natural gas, it was it was seen as uh, as waste. And rather than just let it, you know, go into the atmosphere and and uh, you know have somebody inadvertently light a match and and uh, burn down an oil field, 
uh, oil companies, petroleum companies would flare it off. They would just burn the natural gas as it came out. Uh, and uh, that was that, you know, of course that created CO2 as well. So there's, there's really no, uh, there's no uh, silver bullet here, I'm afraid. Let's talk about this homestead notion and how stuff gets into your house. This is, uh, this is my homestead, in fact. Uh, electricity comes in the back of the house through cables, uh, overhead cables. Uh, natural gas comes in the front of the house through buried gas lines. Uh, propane comes into my house via the driveway. Uh, I use propane tanks to, uh, to fire up my uh, trusty barbecue grill. Um, so that's just, you know, uh, that's just part of the deal. It turns out that auto fuel, of course, also comes into my homestead through my car uh, and all the oils that are associated with that, or they, they did, we'll get to that in a few minutes. And then there's all the other stuff, you know, all the other petroleum based products that we, uh, that we discussed or noted in the previous slides, which usually comes in uh, through my driveway and front door as well. Uh, courtesy of Amazon drivers and, and uh, people like that, and myself. So um, let's take a, a, a careful look at electricity and electricity generation. The reason we want to do this is because most of the alternatives that we describe uh, and that are alternatives to things that you may use or things, ways that you may get fossil fuels in your home, uh, rely on the, the notion that you could shift them to electricity and that electricity could be generated by renewable resources. Uh, if you, uh, for example, have a gas hot water heater, natural gas hot water heater, and you decide that you want to save the world by switching over to an electric hot water heater, and uh, it turns out, though, that your provider is burning mostly coal oil uh, coal and, and uh, oil to generate that electricity, you've just created a net bad. Uh, you've gone from natural gas, which is a bit cleaner, the cleanest of the fossil fuels, uh, to dirty fossil fuels because your electric provider is burning oil and coal in order to provide that electricity. So um, we're, we're going to make a pitch here that you need to make sure that your electricity is generated by renewable resources. And that's kind of where we'll end up being uh, as we proceed. This is a, a good example of all the different uh, ways that uh, electricity is generated in the United States. Uh, as you can see, the, the bulk of it up until uh, uh, 2010 or so was petroleum and uh, petroleum-based things with, uh, I'm sorry, with uh, coal and coal-based things. Coal uh, is being phased out so you can see that uh, declining and um, renewables, of course, are starting to increase, but still most electricity is produced by um, coal, natural gas, uh, and uh, some by nuclear. And only uh, a small percentage of it right now is produced by renewable sources, but uh, that's increasing as the use of the others decrease. Most um, providers have been using natural gas to replace coal and petroleum. Uh, so those natural gas plants will be around for quite some time, uh, probably 30 year, year, years or more before they're decommissioned. Uh, but the good news is that that should uh, give us the opportunity to make that green slice a lot bigger than it shows uh, than it's shown right here. Uh, if we look at Maryland's uh, net electricity generation, we see that most of it comes from, uh, uh, a lot of it comes from nuclear, which was kind of surprising uh, for me to discover. Uh, second highest is coal fired and then natural gas fired. Very little petroleum uh, generated in the state of Maryland and uh, only uh, a little bit of uh, hydroelectric and a small portion of non-hydroelectric renewables. Hydroelectric is, uh, electric is dams. Uh, we'll look at those in a couple of minutes, but that gives you a sense for the mix that's generated in Maryland. Now, it's important that I said in Maryland there for reasons that will become obvious here in a couple of minutes. Um, these are uh, alternatives, um, and we saw this slide already, and we'll see it again. The alternatives are solar on a utility scale and wind farms on a utility scale. All of those can be used to produce electricity that can uh, feed the particular grid that you're connected to 
Uh, so it's not like you have to be directly connected to a solar farm or to a wind farm in order to get the benefits. There are lots of different ways to do that. And we'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. Um, other ways that we can, uh, these are some of the other ways that we can do something that is close to renewable. Hydroelectric in the upper left, that's a dam. That's uh, the water pressure is used to drive turbines and those turbines are used to produce electricity. Uh, there is a downside and that is that eventually the, the uh, waterway behind the dam starts to silt up and eventually it becomes such that the, that the uh, at least the electrical generation portion of it has to be decommissioned. But that could be, you know, 30 to 50 years before that becomes a major problem on any, any hydroelectric project. Uh, can't just blow the dam up and let the water go though because downstream from that there's been tremendous development. So the dam's going to be there for a long time whether it's and building silt up, whether it's generating electricity or not. On the upper right corner is uh, depicts uh, geothermal energy. Uh, it turns out as you as you dig into the earth, you find layers that are of relatively constant temperature that don't change. If you dig down deep enough, the temperature stays the same. <clears throat> Pardon me. So you can use that to if your uh, home is warm, you can pump warm air uh, down and have it cooled and then brought back up into your house to serve as, uh, as air conditioning. You can use it vice versa, since it's uh, uh, constant temperature, uh, farther down you go, you can use the notion of that constant temperature to also create heat, to heat your home. So it's, uh, it's pretty efficient, although it is a pretty expensive proposition since it's generally done uh, on an individual home basis. Uh, down at the very bottom is, uh, is a nuclear plant. Uh, nuclear is uh, uh, an interesting issue. Uh, it is renewable in that the nuclear fuel lasts a very long time and it does not generate uh, carbon dioxide as it produces electricity. Uh, however, what you see coming out of those stacks is, is steam, so it's water vapor. Uh, but having said that, uh, uh, it also generates a lot of heat. And that's why you always find uh, nuclear plants ne next to uh, rivers or uh, other bodies of water because they need that water to cool the reactor, uh, to keep a, a, the right temperature on the reactor. And then that water is, you know, it's not contaminated or anything, but it is pushed back into the waterway as uh, much warmer water. That has a tremendous impact on, on uh, various aquatic life and, and uh, so on. Uh, so it, it's a it's a it's a problem, uh, and it's one of the downsides of nuclear energy. The other side, a downside, of course, is that we haven't figured out what to do with spent fuel. Uh, America has not come to grips with the fact that we've got a whole bunch of spent nuclear, radioactive nuclear fuel uh, around, usually being stored on site on at the power plant, <clears throat> power plant because we haven't come up with an acceptable, uh, common approach to. Uh, dealing with nuclear waste. Every proposal uh, that's been made so far has been shot down because, uh, uh, you know, it's either not economically viable or uh, people don't particularly want nuclear waste uh, in their backyard or in their state, uh, for that matter. And there are uh, proposals to shoot nuclear waste into the sun, but uh, those uh, seem to have increased uh, the cost, or would increase the cost of electricity pretty dramatically. So. Uh, that's not likely to go anywhere. Uh, fortunately for uh, us in the state of Maryland, the state of Maryland is what's called an electric choice state. So you get your electricity from uh, bg e or Pepco or somebody like that, and you pay them. Uh, they either generate electricity using their own facilities or they purchase electricity from other electricity generators. You have the choice of who's generating that electricity. You don't have the choice about who's delivering it because that's based on you know, who put the cables in for you. But you do have a choice about who provides that uh, generation of electricity to uh, BG&E or Pepco or whoever. This is a website, and we'll send out links to all these things, but uh, it's just a, a website for Maryland Electric Choice, and it helps you shop for an electric supplier. <clears throat> Pardon me. These are two examples uh, that come up. Uh, they're all, uh, you can put filters in that say, yes, I would like a fixed price plan or 
uh, you know, I'd like a term of 12 months so that I know what my electricity is going to cost for the next 12 months. Uh, I want it to be 100% renewable, and I don't want any fees to cancel it or monthly fees or anything like that. So you can you can put all kinds of filters in here, and the filters will provide you with those providers of electricity that are contracted with uh, that have contracts with BGE to provide their electricity. So what does that mean? That means you can select a provider that uses only renewable uh, uh, sources, uh, usually hydroelectric, solar, uh, nuclear is considered a renewable resource uh, or wind. And uh, by um, buying it that way, uh, it's quite possible you might have to pay a few pennies more per kilowatt hour, uh, but you're you know, doing the world a big favor by using um, renewable uh, generation of electricity. Uh, BGE could care less uh, whether you use their mix or whether you you know bring somebody else's mix into it, uh, because they 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 make their money by providing it to you. They they are uh, you know the distribution is how they make their money. So um, let's take a look at what all this means to us and how we can make use of this. This is a, a table for one of these providers of electricity, and there are a couple of things that I want to point out here. Uh, this is a company called WGL that provides energy to BGE and others, uh, and it provides uh, what's most utilities, uh, BGE included, by what's called the PJM system mix. Uh, let me describe what that means. Uh, all of, um, well, let's take a look at it real quick. PJM mix is, you know, primarily gas, some nuclear, some coal. Uh, if you get down towards the bottom, you see that wind, hydroelectric, and uh, solar voltaic are uh, small portions of, uh, of everything that's generated here. And at the very bottom, you see what that means in terms of uh, some of the air emissions that are greenhouse gas producers, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and sulfur dioxide. Uh, and that's a, a fair amount. That's uh, CO2 in pounds per megawatt hour, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, a lot. Now, what do we mean by PJM? Well, the way the way things work is the, the country is uh, kind of divided up into regional um, markets for energy. The PJM market was originally the PJM uh, meant Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland. Um, it, that's originally what it was, but now it's expanded to everything you see in the tan there. Um, what that means is that all the producers of electricity in that area feed a common grid. So everybody who produces electricity in the PJM area does so uh, pumping it into a common grid. So you don't actually buy energy directly that's produced by any particular supplier. You buy energy that uh, is mixed in that grid, if you will. So you don't buy BG&E uh, electricity when you pay BG&E you're buying whatever you know, BGE contributes to the grid and what everybody else contributes to the grid. So, so obviously, if there were more uh, producers of renewable energy, then the grid you're connected to would have more renewable energy in it. Let me look a little closer uh, detail at PJM. You can see what some of the companies are here, uh, uh, primarily for us, uh, uh, Pepco, Delmarva Power and Light, Baltimore Gas and Light, but some Allegheny Power out in the Western part of Virginia. Uh, but it all feeds the same grid. So we're all connected together. So, uh, um, and that of, of course is a, uh, an interesting uh, engineering problem all in of itself, but uh, all the producers in these places uh, produce electricity that feeds this common grid. So back to this table for just a moment. And you can see that WGL produces different mixes depending upon who they're selling to. A large commercial energy fuel mix has uh, less coal, uh, less nuclear, uh, less natural gas, and more um, uh, things down towards the bottom there, more hydroelectric, more wind, uh, and more solar. Um, they also have a small commercial mix, which is uh, they just you know, punch uh, roughly 3.5% of uh, wind uh, into the PJM mix, which changes the distributions there. But as you can see, uh, both of those options reduce carbon dioxide emissions somewhat, although not dramatically by any means. 
they have a program that is a residential 5% uh, wind included in the PJM mix. Uh, and you can buy that directly from them. And that is, uh, that, they, that is just what it says. Uh, uh, you know, it's more wind uh, than in the other areas. And it gives you, uh, it reduces the carbon dioxide and other air emissions. Uh, there is also a 50%, now that, that residential wind, 5% uh, wind for the PJM with the PJM does not mean that the 5% is necessarily produced inside the PJM market. It may be produced in other markets. And uh, uh, in, other, in other words, instead of buying wind power in your grid, you're buying wind power generated somewhere uh, thus, it's called, it's a national good is what it's called, and they call those national wind programs. The local wind programs, the last two columns over there, are energy produced by renewable sources inside the PJM uh, um, area. You can, you can contract uh, with WGL and other, others, uh, for that matter, uh, to buy 50% uh, local wind or 100% local wind. Uh, I uh, obviously the my heart's in you know that particular place. I contracted for 100% local wind some time ago. Um, I am paying, I believe, just under ten dollars more a month for 100% wind energy. Now, let's back up. That doesn't mean that I'm connected to a bunch of uh, uh, wind turbines. It means that the amount of energy that I use uh, is being produced inside the PJM market and it's being fed into that common grid. So in a way, I'm indeed you know, wind powered. Uh, I have an electric vehicle and I like to, uh, I've got a little sign on the side of it that says this is a wind powered vehicle. That raises my eyebrows because people don't see the sales, uh, but uh, they do see, uh, uh, you know, once, uh, once you explain that you can purchase renewable energy through your electric provider, thanks to Maryland's great program, uh, they begin to see uh, uh, the light, if you will. And if you look down that column on 100% wind, it is just that, 100% wind, which produces uh, uh, no carbon dioxide in its use and no nitrogen oxide or sulfur uh, oxide, dioxide in its use. Um, so, uh, a net good for everyone concerned and something that I feel pretty proud of, to be honest with you. This is a, a typical solar farm. Uh, this particular solar farm is uh, in the city of Bowie. And I think it will be commissioned in July or August, if I remember correctly. Uh, Ashley can correct me at some point if that's not right. Uh, it is constructed. This is a drone view of it. Um, and that provides 2.5 megawatts of power. The city didn't build it, the city contracted to have it built, and the city contracts with the, the owner, if you will, uh, the builder, the developer, uh, for electricity, but that means that the city is buying uh, all the electricity that this will produce, which is 2.5 megawatts, which is about 60% of what the city's municipal use of electricity is. All the buildings that the city has, uh, all the uses of electricity that the city has directly, uh, about 60% of all of that is provided by this solar farm or will be provided by this solar farm. Uh, thanks to some state uh, um, uh, bills that passed uh, this past uh, session, uh, the city will also be able to contract for a second uh, 2.5 megawatt facility next to this one. That's uh, uh, hadn't been, uh, you know, in a budget yet, but that's certainly a plan that the council has expressed a desire to pursue. That would mean that the city, municipal part of the city, would be all provided, uh, all powered by a, uh, a renewable resource, and um, the only exception to that being, you know, some of the heavy public works uh, uh, equipment, but then there, you know, there's there are visions to replace your you know, garbage collection truck with an electric garbage collection truck, which means that it could be powered by this as well. Uh, there will also be some uh, electricity generation left over, which will likely be uh, pumped into the grid. And uh, in essence, you can you know, buy uh, that kind of electric power as well. So uh, a lot of options, a lot of possibilities. Um, I will, um, 
point out that there's a downside to all this. Uh, at the end of their uh, life, uh, the photovoltaic panels are difficult to recycle. Uh, nobody's really come up with a good economical way to do that yet. There's a lot of stuff in the mill, uh, a lot of hope. The panels are usually serviceable for around 30 years. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, you know, not, not many uh, um, solar facilities have been uh, decommissioned, certainly utility scales. Uh, uh, have been decommissioned yet, uh, but uh, there's a lot of research going on on how to take those things apart and recycle the parts. The this is uh, this is <clears throat> these are parts of cut up wind turbine blades, and pardon me for a moment. They're being put into a landfill now. That sounds like a pretty bad idea. <clears throat> and it is a pretty bad idea. Fortunately, there are a lot of people that are working hard to find alternative uses uh, for this material. It's all plastic and, and fiberglass, so it's going to last forever. If you cover it with dirt, it's going to still be down there in probably 500 years or more. Uh, so uh, probably this is probably not the best way to uh, dispose of uh, decommissioned uh, wind turbines. But there's, uh, there's a lot of research underway. Here are a couple of uh, options that are being worked uh, one is to use those wind turbine blades, which are very long, very tall, and very sturdy uh, as uh, uh, power line, uh, the things to hold up power lines uh, to replace the erector sets that you normally see holding up power lines. Um, and, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, a good use of that. And as a matter of fact, it may be particularly useful uh, as a way to help uh, developing nations uh, build their grid. Uh, why would you want to use erector sets, which eventually rust and have to be replaced when these are likely to last for much longer? Uh, down in the lower right, you can see another interesting use for these. Uh, the profile of a blade uh, makes it just about right to serve as a roof system. So you could have a single unit, as you see here, or you could have a much larger unit with multiple segments of, um, of these uh, wind turbine blades. Uh, as uh, serving as a roof, and it's lightweight and sturdy and uh, provides a, a lot of benefit. So there are a lot of different ways and a lot of different people who are working very hard to figure out how to make sure that these are indeed renewable uh, resources, not just renewable and then throw the parts away. This is a, a picture of the city of Bowie's. Let's talk a little bit about transportation now. This is the city of Bowie's electric fleet. Uh, at the moment, or at least part of the electric fleet. There are three uh, EVs there that are uh, plugged into their chargers. There's one uh, hybrid uh, electric plug-in electric vehicle on the far right down there. And the police department has uh, electric motorcycles. Uh, there are lots of advantages to this. These are used mostly for inspection, code enforcement kinds of things, because it's perfect for you know, driving short distances around the city, even though these have a, a pretty fair range of uh, between 150 and 180 miles. Um, I, I have an EV with a range of almost 300 miles uh, and uh, it's served me quite well. And I will describe that a little more in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, all of these, if you consider the fact that the city uses a lot of uh, uh, renewable energy right now, because it has put a lot of solar panels on its own buildings. Uh, and this will add to that uh, renewability because using that solar farm, power from that solar farm, uh, these cars will be essentially solar powered uh, because that's what will be feeding these charging stations. Uh, the city of Bowie has also, uh, uh, you may have seen this at the Ken Hill Center in the lower right. This is a uh, commercial BG&E charging uh, station uh, set up with uh, two uh, 240 volt chargers and one big fast charger on the left-hand side there. Uh, fast chargers, DC fast chargers nowadays are capable of uh, getting a full charge or at least getting an 80% charge uh, on a car in less than an hour. So, and that, you know, as uh, technology advances, that's coming down. So if anybody has range anxiety or uh, doesn't like the idea of parking their car for uh, five hours while uh, uh, it's plugged into a, a, a charging station, uh, help is on the way. Um, I just plug mine in overnight. And uh, by the way, I, I might add that these are these are commercial 
the ones you're looking at on the bottom is a commercial system. It's not a freebie. The city contracted to have the installation done for free, uh, but uh, it'll still be being charged at, uh, at BG&E's electric rates, which I think is somewhere around 10 or 11 percent, 11 uh, cents uh, per kilowatt hour. It's, it's not a lot, but, uh, but it is something. And, uh, uh, but the big advantage of course is that um, I have a home charger for my uh, electric vehicle, which has a range of about 300 miles, as I said, uh, I can charge it overnight easily uh, up to 100%. And it's been costing me for the past year and a half, uh, about three cents a mile to operate. The average internal combustion engine car costs somewhere between 11 and 15 cents a mile to operate. Uh, because you're buying gasoline for it, you're you know changing the oil and all the other things that are associated with internal combustion engines, uh, which uh, means the cost is pretty high. My first maintenance appointment uh, for my car is at 10,000 miles to have the tires rotated. Uh, there's no oil involved. Uh, there's no gasoline involved. Uh, the only thing that ever has to be done is you got to grease the bearings. Uh, from time to time and uh, make sure that everything's working right. So uh, maintenance costs are down uh, for electric fleets and that's uh, you know turning into a big selling point. An electric vehicle right now may cost a little bit more, uh, but with uh, uh, you know fairly generous federal and state subsidies, uh, for example, uh, a combination of BG and E and Maryland state subsidies bought my home charging station. So uh, this is a good time to get in on the ground floor. Those kinds of incentives won't last forever, I'm sure. So uh, looking at uh, a little bit more at the idea of transportation, this, uh, you know, just a review of the electric sources over here on the left, but on the right, you see the annual emissions per vehicle by vehicle type. A standard gasoline internal combustion engine produces in excess of uh, 10,000 uh, pounds of CO2 uh, and I think that is, yeah, that's annual, right? Okay, so 10,000, over 10,000 pounds of CO2 equivalent. Uh, less for a hybrid, obviously, because a hybrid operates at least part-time on an electric battery. <clears throat> a plug-in hybrid is even better because uh, that is uh, charged, uh, you know, by other than gasoline kinds of resources. And usually a plug-in hybrid uh, has a, a fair range on just the electric battery itself. Uh, nowadays, it's very common to get between 30 and 50 miles of range for both a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid, uh, which for most people living in this area, you know, is uh, that's, that's a commuter vehicle for sure. Uh, not many people commute more than 50 miles a day, thank goodness for that. Um, and then, of course, an all-electric uh, produces uh, a very few pounds of CO2 equivalent and that's in uh, uh, usually not tail, there's no tailpipe, so it's not emissions in that sense. Uh, that is uh, usually emissions that are created by the electric uh, uh, pr provider and by the fact that your tires wear out and that produces uh, CO2 uh, equivalent as the rubber sloughs off your tires. So net, uh, that's good. Um, you don't have to uh, memorize this. We'll send it to you in the email that comes after the fact. Uh, but it's a uh, checklist if you want to look into whether you want to, you know, pursue an electric vehicle or not. Produced by Consumer Reports uh, talks about charging and all the different ways that that happens. Uh, the incentives that are available right now. Uh, I got, uh, uh, you know, a seventy-five hundred dollars tax break from the feds and. A, I think it was a, a $3,500 tax break from the state of Maryland when I bought my uh, EV in 2019, which put it down to a price that was no more than I would have paid for an equivalent uh, internal combustion engine car. Um, this talks about how much it costs to charge and you know how you can make sure that your uh, utility is providing the right kind of power or that your uh, uh, you contract with your utility to make sure that you're charging your car uh, when the uh, electricity usage on the grid is the least, uh, and they'll give you a lower rate as a result of that. So lots of incentives in the middle, uh, lots of reasons to look for it. And, uh, and uh, you know, let's look um, at some other ways that fossil fuels get into your home besides 
transportation. These are all things that are uh, that operate on gasoline engines, and they're all things that uh, that we have and we use: uh, lawnmowers, trimmers, blowers, uh, and down on the lower right, you even got an emergency generator uh, that runs on uh, gasoline. Um, and I imagine a lot of folks in Bowie have emergency generators because there was a time, not in the past five or six years, but there was a time a decade ago when we would lose power frequently and it would stay gone for quite some time. I think the last time I had a major power failure was when that derecho came through here some uh, a few years back and we were down for about three days. Uh, one of the hurricanes uh, uh, prior to that, we were down for about five days. Uh, as a result of that, I bought some generators because uh, I learned a lesson that you can only, uh, well, let's just say that my my wife was out of town, bless her uh, heart and her luck, uh, when the uh, when it all shut down for the hurricane and my son and I were in a position where we didn't have anything uh, like a generator at the time. And uh, we had to cook all the food in our refrigerator on the uh, propane grill. And I tell you, you have not lived until you've had grilled apple pie. Um, the ice cream didn't work out, but the grilled apple pie was absolutely delicious. What's interesting about all these things, take a lawnmower, for example. The lawnmower produces about as much, a lawnmower produces about as much CO2 as, say, a Toyota Camry, uh, because it's a two cycle engine. It burns dirtier to begin with, and there's no pollution control on it. Uh, like there is on an automobile with a catalytic converter and all those other kinds of things. So you think of your lawnmower as, a, as a, an automobile when you think about its use of gasoline and all these other things are two cycle engines as well. So they're all uh, producing fair amounts of, uh, of uh, unfair amounts of CO2, I guess I should say, not fair amounts. Um, other ways that these uh, things, uh, petroleum uh, products and uh, fossil fuels might come in your house. Uh, this is a typical propane gas grill. And this is a, uh, not typical yet, but uh, almost typical uh, little gas fire thing that you put out on your deck if you feel like sitting on your deck in the wintertime. Uh, I've noted, by the way, from personal experience, I don't have one, but friends who do, that uh, they don't really produce much heat and uh, they burn propane, which produces a, a fair amount of CO2 emission as well. So uh, probably not all in all, not a net good. Uh, it turns out, of course, that there are everything we've talked about so far, there are um, uh, electrical, electric alternatives. Now, again, I just wanna stress that the fact that you switch from a uh, propane grill to an electric grill, and such a thing does exist, uh, the fact that you're making that switch, uh, that only is a net good if your provider is providing you with enough renewable uh, in your mix to make that worthwhile. If, they're, if your provider is still burning coal, oil, and natural gas, uh, you haven't really changed the equation very much at all. You might as well, you might even have made it worse. So you've got to make sure you understand where you're getting your electricity when we talk about all these uh, electricity alternatives. But uh, let's take let's take a look at some of those. There are uh, electrical uh, electric battery electric, and I stress the term battery electric because uh, who wants to run around, you know, towing a 200 foot extension cord on the back of their lawnmower? I tried that many years ago when the only electric lawnmower you could buy was uh, was operated by plugging it in, and uh, it turned out to uh, probably double the time it took me to mow my lawn because I had to manage uh, not running over the cord and making sure that I was mowing in a pattern, you know, that would allow me to continue to stream the cord out behind me. It became quite the, uh, quite the, uh, quite the task. Uh, I was very thankful when battery operated lawnmowers came along, but when they first did, they were twice as expensive as equivalent uh, gasoline mowers. So they were just not, uh, uh, you know, not part of the mix, not part of the are the possible for most of us, uh, even with the city's uh, wonderful um, rebate program for um, both electric and comp uh, composting, uh, mulching uh, lawnmowers. Uh, what's nice about this is nowadays, you can see that all these are electric things that have you know, batteries, uh, trimmers, blowers, chainsaws, head shears, and everything else. Uh, what's nice is nowadays there are manufacturers that are producing whole lines of all tools uh, used, used outside in all of these. This is one manufacturer 
that is producing all these different tools, all of which run on the same batteries. So you can have, uh, uh, you know, depending upon the manufacturer, you can have a great selection of yard appliances, tools, uh, uh, you know, whatever you want to call them, that all run off the same rechargeable uh, lithium or NICAD batteries. These are all lithium, as most of the uh, you know, heavy duty ones are for this yard work. Um, and the other advantage, of course, is that, uh, you know, that means you can have a lot of tools and just a few batteries, uh, which is usually the biggest cost involved. Uh, if you if you do that uh, with these rechargeables, as long as you don't, you're not trying to use all these things at once, that's uh, uh, that's certainly not a problem. Uh, I know that I hand uh, my mower, trimmer, and blower all use the same battery packs. Uh, and since I can't mow, trim, and blow simultaneously, that turns out not to be a problem. Uh, I have two batteries because one of them came with the lawnmower and one came with the other device. Uh, but uh, those two batteries are more than enough to allow me to maintain the property on my homestead. So uh, lots of benefits here. Another uh, side benefit is, by the way, that those lithium batteries and even the NICAD batteries are uh, recyclable. So not only are you using renewable energy, hopefully using renewable energy to charge these batteries, uh, you're also able to recycle those batteries when they reach the end of their useful life. Uh, I have been using battery operated yard tools for probably three years now. And I, I had, I've had one battery uh, die in, in the course of three years. So it's, uh, you know, it seems to be pretty reliable on top of everything else. And, you know, uh, unlike a, a two cycle engine, there's a lot less to worry about in maintenance terms. Uh, you don't have to get tune up. You don't have to worry about carburetors getting clogged. You don't have to worry about what you do with the gas in the winter time when you're not using the device. Uh, so a lot of a lot of net benefits to uh, switching to these kinds of things if you can. Um, there are also some kind of unusual uses for uh, renewables. And in this case, what you're looking at on the left is a, uh, a solar uh, emergency generator. Uh, part of it is uh, all battery. So you're charging a battery and then you can uh, run your house uh, or at least a, a fair portion of your house uh, off the uh, generator that comes off the battery. So that's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, battery obviously is DC, so it has to be an inverter there to convert it to AC, but uh, you can, uh, you know, plug refrigerators into this, or you can actually get one of a size uh, that you could use as an emergency generator to run your entire house. Now, and, and you might ask, I know my, I gave my brother-in-law a solar flashlight for Christmas one year. And he looked at me and he was serious when he asked, this was a long time ago, uh, but he said, well, what good is a solar flashlight? Because you need it when the sun isn't out. And I said, okay, I got you, you know, good, good point. Uh, it's because it has a, a NICAD or lithium ion battery in it and the solar, the sun charges the battery and the battery produces the light. Oh, said he, I see how that works now. Same thing for all of these devices when you think about it. On the right-hand side there, you see a, a small, relatively portable emergency, uh, emergency uh, generator that's solar powered uh, with a battery in it that is just right for what we seem to be experiencing in Bowie nowadays, which is you know power outages of short duration uh, and they don't last very long at all. And, uh, um, uh, or they don't happen very often. Uh, so this is enough to make sure that you're keeping your, uh, keeping your food safe and cold. Uh, and that's uh, not terribly expensive. So lots of alternatives. Uh, here's some interesting uses that you might not have thought of, a snow blower that runs on batteries. Uh, and uh, here's a couple of uh, power washers, one of which is a plug-in uh, power washer. I have one of those. And then there are now uh, battery operated power washers that produce enough energy to you know, wash your sidewalks or your deck or your house or whatever it is you happen to be washing. So for, for most of the things that we looked at that are ways that fossil fuels come into our homestead, at least the outside part of our homestead, there are electrical electric alternatives. Uh, and if you're using renewable energy as at least part of the mix for your electricity, then it's probably a net good thing for both you financially and for uh, buoy and for the earth uh, in terms of health and, uh, and so on. 
So um, there are a couple of other ways that petroleum products get into your outside homestead. I think there are just north of 100 um, lawn uh, services that serve buoy, and all of them provide all kinds of benefits to you, like weed control and insect control and fertilizer, uh, most of which have at their source uh, petroleum products. Uh, the lower right shows, shows a guy uh, spraying for uh, insect control. And there's a reason they put that sign on your lawn. Uh, and that is because they're poisons and they're poisons that are petroleum based and they enter the atmosphere and generate their own CO2 and other emissions. Uh, and they are not healthy. Uh, there are usually alternatives uh, to control insects and weeds and certainly alternatives in terms of fertilizer. Uh, so, you know, um, think about that when you're contracting with a lawn service. Uh, I know that a lot of people contract to have their lawn mowed. Uh, those folks are using internal combustion engines because they're using, you know, tractors and ride on lawn mowers and, and you know, uh, ride behind lawn mowers. Uh, and there just aren't a lot on the market right now uh, in terms of commercial uh, mowers that are electric, and they're also using these petroleum products to take care of your property as well. So uh, just think about that. I have, uh, I mow my own lawn, but I have a, uh, a service for fertilizer and weed control, but they are certified uh, organic non-petroleum uh, industry products uh, and um, a lot less damage to the environment uh, using the products that they use. So you know, just uh, look carefully at how your lawn service uh, is providing that service to you and make some wise decisions on that basis. Um, there are a bazillion other ways that you can electrify, electric stoves versus gas stoves, electric hot water heaters, electric dryers, electric air conditioners, electric cars, electric, uh, you know, all kinds of things. You may have a hot tub. Uh, normally that would be uh, heated by natural gas in, the, in our area because that's how things turned out to be wired. Uh, I have a pipe, uh, I have a swimming pool and I have a heater on it that is uh, operated by natural gas. Um, I will, uh, next time I change, I change to electric uh, since my electricity is being produced by wind and feel good about it. Uh, some in this area might have a little sauna like this. There are electric versions of that. There are electric fireplaces uh, that simulate uh, fireplaces quite well and uh, uh, do just as, exactly what natural gas fireplaces do, which is, you know, they don't produce all that much heat, but they certainly are aesthetically pleasing. Um, you know, electric external lights, electric, uh, this is a, you know, ride on electric lawnmower. We're starting to see uh, more of those on the market. Uh, on the far right hand corner is an electric grill. So all of these things are ways that you can electrify your home and not uh, bring petroleum resources into it. Looking inside the home now, this is just uh, one example of a lot of different things that you can do inside your home. Uh, but bear in mind that, again, if you electrify all the stuff in your home, uh, that really works best if you are using an electric provider that provides you with some renewable energy. All of these, the, the, again, one of the advantages of all this is all these use the same batteries. So you can have a, a whole collection of tools that are using the same uh, rechargeable battery. And most manufacturers are providing this now. You know, all their tools are using interchangeable batteries. So you don't have to worry about buying so many batteries. And uh, even those batteries as lithium ion batteries are recyclable. So this is a good, good selection of electrical tools here. Uh, to show you the, the uh, extent that some uh, idiots like me might go to, uh, I had a stairwell that was kind of a, a hazard in the dark. And if I didn't want to turn the overhead lights on in the middle of the night and wake everybody else up, I just found these uh, uh, battery operated, you know, hang on the wall uh, lights that are motion sensors that light the stairwell as you walk up or down the stairwell. And I use rechargeable batteries and those rechargeable batteries, of course, are charged by my, by my wind energy. Uh, I did find that uh, um, these types of, and these are not lithium ion, these are uh, NICAT batteries. They don't last as long as an alkaline battery and um, as long on a charge. So I found myself charging them, I won't say frequently, but you know, uh, maybe every three weeks or a month I had to charge these 
and uh, it, it wasn't a big problem. Uh, I had a number of different ways to do that. I put a uh, four foot solar cell on my roof and I used that to charge most of the things that would plug into uh, say a car uh, cigarette lighter. Do they call them that nowadays? Uh, cigarette lighter uh, uh, outlet. So anything that I can charge with 12 volts, uh, I can charge with that uh, thing that's on my roof. This is a, a little portable charger that I found uh, early on in my foray into uh, solar batter, uh, solar charging batteries. It's just a little box that you can see, you can put a, a handful of batteries in and you close the door and the door, the top of the door is a little solar cell and you just stick it outside and uh, it charges the batteries and tells you when they're charged. So it's actually, uh, it's actually pretty cool. And it's something that you could uh, take on a camping trip with you for that matter. Uh, and there are lots of things like that now. This is just one example of that that was fairly early in terms of technology, but uh, but useful, still useful. Uh, just to prove uh, continuous improvement and that uh, nerds like me really exist, uh, I found some replacement lights for the ones that I was using NICAD batteries on that uses uh, lithium uh, batteries. And uh, these are held on my uh, stairwell there by a little magnetic plate. Uh, and when they, uh, and I haven't yet had to do this, but when their charge runs down and it's been probably three months or so now that I've had these up. Uh, I haven't had one of them uh, fail yet and, and it hasn't discharged uh, yet, but when it does, I take it off the wall and it plugs into any USB port and uh, charges in any USB port. And I'm sure if you're anything like me, you've got hundreds of USB ports lying around your house in one form or another. So uh, that's pretty cool. I haven't had to recharge them yet, but when I do, it's gonna be a piece of cake. So having said that, let's see if we can uh, start to wrap this up. Um, we're going to provide you with uh, an after the fact uh, set of resources. Among them are things like this, which is a link to uh, an Electrify Everything website, uh, which is not just a, a practical guide to throwing away gas and everything, all the other ways that petroleum might come into your house, but it also provides some cost benefit uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, things. Uh, this is uh, another thing that we'll send you a link to. This is embedded in a site. It's an infographic that talks uh, uh, that, you know, this is something you might uh, show your neighbors. Uh, you know, what does it mean to electrify everything in your house? And as you scroll down this infographic, uh, you get, you know, just a short version of everything we've been talking about here. Um, we'll send uh, that resource out as well. Uh, remember that there's a lot of other stuff that comes in your house that's petroleum based that's probably not good for you or the environment. Uh, petroleum derived things like polyester, nylon, acrylics, and spandex, which means I had to get rid of my spandex bathing suits, I guess. Uh, all this, uh, uh, these are all uses that can be uh, replaced. Uh, plastic shopping bags are uh, bad because it's very hard to recycle them. Plastic water bottles are interesting and you try to recycle them, but they can only be recycled. That plastic can only be recycled a couple of times before it, uh, the polymers start to break down and it can't be used uh, anymore, um, uh, which is true of most plastic utensils and most synthetic fibers. Uh, there's also, uh, uh, you know, all the plastic uh, containers that we buy all of our wet stuff in, uh, which, uh, you know, in theory could be replaced by glass uh, refillable containers. Uh, I used to buy um, sparkling water in plastic, uh, single use plastic bottles. Uh, I got, you know, wise one day and said, wait a minute, that's not a good idea. And I now buy uh, uh, that in, in glass bottles, which are uh, almost forever recyclable. And those uh, glass bottles uh, serve me quite well. And I feel great because they're not, you know, your, your plastic bottles and plastic jugs are normally wrapped in plastic wrap and these come in in a cardboard carton. So I get a bunch of glass refillable containers in a cardboard carton, uh, you know, all of which is good. And, uh, you know, I quit using my disposable razor. Disposable, what an interesting concept, as if anything is really disposable. Uh, just to give you a sense for what the city's doing, uh, this is a uh, screenshot of the Green Buoy uh, site on the Green, on the uh, Buoy website and uh, all the things on the right hand side that you can link to. 
um, green buoy happenings. Of course, those are the, among other things, the webinars we're putting on. Uh, through this, you'll be able to find the you know, some of the incentives that we were that we were talking about. Uh, you know, for like lawn mowers and and even trees, by the way. Which we, uh, you know, since trees absorb carbon dioxide, the city has an interest in making sure that we have a fairly uh, uh, adequate coverage of, uh, of uh, tree uh, canopy in the, in the footprint of the city of Bowie. So the uh, city is offering was offering rebates to buy trees and plant on your property. It's now offering the opportunity to have the city install a tree on your property. So you get a tree and the installation of the tree. Uh, that's not, you know, there aren't thousands of those available, but uh, I don't think we've hit the threshold yet. So, um, and that's just going to be a standard budget item, I guess, from now on, those kinds of incentives. So all good and uh, all useful. And this link will take you to a lot of places where you can find a lot of good information. At, uh, in 2020, we had, uh, by resolution, the city council declared uh, 2020 buoy Earth Year 2020 because that was the year of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, in the past, the city has uh, resolved to celebrate Earth Day with various activities and, and uh, uh, information available to residents. Um, based on the fact that we were going to have an Earth Year, uh, we started putting together programs and, uh, and uh, you know, displays and all kinds of other things. Uh, and then uh, COVID put the uh, skids on all of those things that we had hoped to be able to accomplish in the Earth Year. Uh, as a result of that, we put together a list of 100 things that residents that we can all do to uh, conserve energy, to conserve water, uh, to uh, electrify, and to uh, generally be good to uh, the earth and be good to the environment. So that there'll be, we'll send you a link to that list as well. There are uh, right now 100 acts of green, and this is the last page. You can see the last one says, okay, now if you can think of one that isn't on this list, please send it to Ashley so she can add it to future editions of this list. So we've reached an interesting point here. I'll just uh, make one more comment before we see if we have any questions. And that is that uh, uh, Ashley and I are going to launch a, uh, I think we said climate, uh, coffee climate uh, conversation, coffee and climate conversation. Uh, those will probably be mornings uh, sometime in the not too distant future. And the idea is to not have this webinar format, which is you know all me and would be talking heads if I wasn't using the screen, uh, uh, which I personally find kind of boring. Uh, but what we would really like to entertain is more conversations uh, with residents and with participants. So we'll provide some information and we'll open up the Zoom so that people can actually participate and get in and ask questions and make comments and and uh, you know correct anything that we might have. Uh, uh, incorrectly stated, uh, more like a town hall or a conversation than uh, just this, uh, these kind of one-way things with Q's and A's. So be on the lookout for that. I think the first one is going to cover uh, the kinds of topics that all of our webinars to date, which is now four, counting the bonus webinar on, uh, on bees. Um, so we'll be, uh, we'll be reviewing some of that material and then opening it up so uh, residents and participants can uh, engage and have conversations, not just with us, but, but with each other. On that, I will ask uh, Ashley if, uh, if we've got any questions or comments and we can deal with that. Thanks, Steve. Um, thanks for all of that information. That was a really great presentation, chock full of, of good information. We did have one question. Um, it was kind of long, so I asked him to actually email it to us separately. Um, but he did ask, can you explain Jevons paradox and how, if you aren't careful about how you spend any savings from switching to more efficient device, you can offset any more car. So that's what you were touching on with the, um, the hot water heater. So I've never heard of it called that, but if you have any, any insight. Well, I, I mean, I have heard it called that and I've read a little bit about that, but the, the, fundamentally that's the point that I was trying to make with, you know, if you, if you're saving the environment by switching to uh, things that are uh, electric or even you know better uh, fossil fuel resources you have to make sure that uh, you haven't uh, bought into 
power that is generated less uh, with renewable resources or clean energy. Uh, you know, exchanging your gas water heater for a uh, electric water heater when your provider uh, provides electricity only through natural gas, obviously no great benefit to that. Uh, and in fact, you're, you know, what you burn uh, of that natural gas still creates CO2 that goes up in the environment. Uh, at least when you switch to a provider, for example, that has uh, a lot of uh, renewable uh, as part of its portfolio, um, you're putting, not only are you buying less uh, uh, CO2 in terms of generation, but you're creating less CO2 in terms of your use of it, even if you're using, uh, for example, uh, you know, natural gas, if your provider provides you with 100% renewable energy, uh, that's a net gain. So the, the paradox is you got to make sure that you understand, as I said, where your electricity is coming from before you think that you're necessarily going to do the environment uh, a favor by switching to something that seems like it should be less uh, harmful to the environment. So, but we'll, we'll respond directly with some resources about Devin's paradox. Yeah, and then the one of the other parts of his question was about um, reaching our climate action plan goals, and I don't think it's really we have the time to go into that here. So that's going to be something that we'll talk about with the coffee and climate discussions. And then last one, Bob just asked, will do we have storage for any excess electricity produced by the solar field? Um, Steve, I don't know if you even have any insight with that. I'm I'm sure that there is, but that's a more that could that should be directed at Maddie Bizzardo. Yeah, she kind of knows the ins and outs. There, there will be some, uh, not uh, you know that's um, there will be some stored uh, energy produced by that that is uh, for the purpose of keeping emergency services going in the city, uh, emergency emergency generator kind of things and uh, and uh, that sort of stuff. Um, right now, I think Maddie has been trying very hard to switch over to all natural gas for those emergency generator kinds of operations. The solar farm and the availability of solar electricity, particularly if we get the second field in, uh, will give her the opportunity as those are decommissioned to replace them with uh, electrical emergency generators. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of net storage, probably not, but enough to make sure the emergency services run. And the, the reason for that is pretty straightforward. We don't have those kinds of power failures, and we don't need that kind of local uh, um, energy storage uh, as if the grid is being fed by renewable resources. So, long answer to a short question. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure we'll talk about that once it's launched. Um, you know the switch is officially flipped. Um, we'll talk about that a lot more in the upcoming sessions. So um, I will send everyone within the next day or two a follow-up email with all of Steve's resources and direct links to the city programs and um, probably the climate action plan, a few other things. And if you guys have any further questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me and Steve and I'll put Steve's email in the CC as well so that you can respond to him. And if there are no more questions, we can go ahead and end it here. Uh, so, can I make one comment, uh, Ashley? Yeah. With regard to the, the climate action plan, no big long answer or anything like that. But um, we have reached a point where the city soon will have hit a threshold in the uh, improvements that it can make, with the exception of the, the fleet of public utility vehicles. Uh, you know, when you start generating all the electricity with renewable resources, uh, you know, there will be thresholds that we will hit or ceilings that will hit and the city can't do much better. Uh, what is going to make a difference as far as climate action plan is concerned is what residents do. And that's, we've got a number of initiatives underway to try to engage residents and, and uh, create some awareness and, and some possibilities uh, for residents to affect their lifestyle as little as possible by uh, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible. So, and I'm having a series of conversations with council members uh, over this next week uh, for just the purpose of uh, understanding that and how we're going to proceed with the climate action plan. So stand by for me. Yeah, and really quickly, Sue just asked if you have any information on tankless water tanks and sorry if that's not what they're called. <laughs> Well, <laughs> tank, tankless water heaters. 
Um, we haven't <laughs> we haven't provided any uh, yet uh, for this, but uh, I looked into it for my own purpose at some point. And when my uh, natural gas water heater goes, I'll be switching to an electric natural heater. Um, there's a lot of information available. You know, they've got kiosks now set up at both Home Depot and uh, and Lowe's from time to time, trying to you know sell tankless water heaters, and they have a lot of information. And of course, there's a ton of information on the on the web about it. If I can find a really uh, good comprehensive resource, I'll make sure it gets included in the uh, package that Ashley sends out. Cool. Well, thank you, Steve. This was really great. Thank you, attendees. And um, yeah, we'll just we'll be following up by the end of the week. And feel free to reach out to us with any other questions. Thanks.